please welcome the incredible Kayla Logue. Thank you for having I always, me. I want to say Logie, I know. Like, <laughs> yeah. or L- Lugie? It's Lugie? No, what's the what's the word? Lugie? That's it's Lugie. Yeah, oh, that's phlegm, isn't it? Yeah, I've had. I'm telling you, growing up, I mean, to me, it seems like a simple last name, but it log like U E just goes away completely. It's a silent for some reason. Logie, right. Lugie, Lagu, Lagu. So oh, that kind of sounds fancy. Yeah, I was like, kind of. Yeah, I'm like, it's just Logue. Super where sad. where are you located? Um, Charlotte area. So right outside of Charlotte and Cornelius, North Carolina. Okay. Where are you located, you, actually? I'm in BC, so in the mountains of British Columbia. Oh, amazing. Yeah. For some reason, I thought you were Canadian. No. You were on a small ca- business Canadian blog, though, weren't you? I was. Okay. Yeah. I saw that. I was like, oh, for sure she's Canadian. (laughs) You're nice like a Canadian. You could pass as a Canadian. (laughs) Well, that's where the south of the United States is. I grew up in South Georgia. So, and North Carolina is kind of that medium. I was in South Georgia and then I was in DC. And then now I'm in North Carolina, which is that perfect balance. Mm. Like it's kind of more the hustle and bustle of the north, but the sweetness of the south. Yeah. So I found people, we were just in Charlotte. No, was not Charlotte. We were in Oh my gosh, where were we in December? <laughs> Charleston. Yeah, North Carolina. Close yeah. enough. <laughs> People were so nice. Oh, oh, it was yeah. surprising. Southern hospitality yeah. is a real thing. Or, 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 or Canadian hospitality, same thing. But for the most part, <laughs> although I think we're kind of going sideways right now. But we won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a book that at the time of this recording is almost out, but is out now. Yes. It and is. That's cool. And tell us what it's called. It is called Always Squeezing Lemons. And the subtitle, one you know, sentence to describe it is taking responsibility to define your own success. I always say success is self-defined. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. And like my book starts of a journey of where I thought success was not self-defined. And through even my own experiences, but also the writing journey, I really realized that. And that's how even the subtitle wasn't something that when I started writing this book, I was like, this is the subtitle. It kind of came with clarity through writing. And, you know, I knew the main message and the purpose. And I just had a story I knew I needed to share and wanted to share with practical ways um, and tools that helped me with my own personal professional growth. But as I started going through it, I was like, this was my problem. And then this is the solution that like I want to be able to provide. What was your problem? So, you know, missed COVID. We all have our crazy COVID stories. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. It was May of 2020. And of course, it, was, it wasn't just a random day that this happened. It was a buildup. But um, I was married and I lived in D.C. I had a dog. I had a thriving Pilates career. And for months building up to this point, um, I was like, this, this isn't it. You know, I don't really know what it is, but... I'm in this marriage that I'm not happy in. I'm in this career that, you know, I enjoy, but I'm stuck. Um, I'm in this whole life that just doesn't feel right. And I had this epiphany and I knew it. And I, of course, I wasn't just like, okay, bye, right off the rip when I realized this, right? I kind of tried to figure out how can I make changes, adjustments, well, radical changes need to be needed to be made. And May of 2020, tried to make it easy and simple, but you know, kind of sometimes you just got to cut, cut the strings and go. So I left with 900 bucks and my ex kept the houses, kept the dogs, kept everything. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm starting over and I'll figure it out. Um, so that was kind of <laughs> obviously a major turning point. Um, and kind of through that process, you know, from 2020 until 2021, I kind of lived like a modern day gypsy, started started some a social media company. It's all friends and families. I had it in a while. Moved to North Carolina where I'm at now in 2021 and started working for a land development company and had a lot of professional success um, through that. So but through that entire experience and I would say probably like a very accelerated growth journey. And writing this book was definitely very helpful in that process, too. I can imagine it was probably like therapy. Oh, writing it. Gosh, yeah. I didn't realize that. I would like had no idea how much (laughs) of a healing journey it would be. But also the vulnerability and the relatability and the experiences and the stories. It's not sugarcoated. It's very raw. Um, 
definitely helped with bringing the real message throughout every single experience. And it really is just a journey of growth and practical ways for other people to do it. I add journal prompts at the end of each chapter um, as kind of a reflection opportunity. Well, I cannot wait to get my hands on this book. It's Um, it's fun. I mean, you know. (laughs) Yeah, well, it sounds fun because I get pitched a lot to be on the show and very few cold pitches come through, but yours was one of them. Oh, I love that. There was something about the story. It it was definitely timely for the episode that we needed. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about this. I'm really intrigued by like the the emotions and the thought process leading up to knowing you needed to radical reinvent your life. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't just like one day you're like, oh, this sucks. I'm done. Right. How long leading up to the moment of you making that decision did it was there invested into deciding to do this? You know, it's interesting because thinking back and reflecting now, I can realize how much longer it was than I even realized. Um, There was a moment, and I'll get to that, that I started to really, when I made, started to make moves because I realized I needed to. But now, like, understanding how self-aware I am now with certain things, like, I'm like, ah, this isn't right, or I'm feeling stuck here, I need to make moves here. I had so many moments of those during my relationship and my career then, and I just didn't know what they were. They were kind of me just constantly ignoring my gut intuition, my instinct to go the opposite direction. But I was doing what I thought I should be doing rather than like what I knew I wanted to be doing. And that's how I just constantly lived life. And then until I got myself stuck in a box that I really couldn't get out of unless I did make radical moves. But it was one day, it was probably, I'm trying to think exact date. It was a fall morning. So probably six months or so before I actually decided to make a move. Um, I was at, my Pilates studio and a longtime client asked me like, Hey, what are your goals with this job? I was like, I don't know. You know, that's actually something I should figure out. I mean, I'm not somebody, and I write about this in my book. Like I'm not somebody that I'm just like coast through life. Like I am a goal setter. Like I am not just trying to chill. Like I want to like go do big things. And I literally took the next day off for the first time in probably two years and sat down with a pen and paper on the patio with my aggressive amount of coffee I was drinking at the time. And I literally was like, where do I see my job in, you know, a week, a month, a year, five years? Where do I see my relationship in a week, a month, a year, five years? Where do I see myself in the same amount of time? And I didn't write anything down. And I was like, what? This is a massive problem. I mean, I sat there all day. Did you, did you feel like there was an answer or were you just not writing it down because that goes against the box? Oh, I just, yeah, I mean, I knew there was an answer, but I was so stuck in that box that I didn't even know how to find it. And there was no like hole to get out. There's no light coming in. There wasn't any light in the direction I was going. No, you didn't know which way was up. I have no idea. It was, it was so interesting. And, and now like, if you give me a piece of paper and I'm like, write down my goals, I give you a whole notebook full. Right. Um, so it's just so interesting when you're, you're so stuck into doing things or something that, you feel like you should be doing rather than asking yourself like purposefully and like intentionally, why do you want to do this? Like mm. who, who is the person that is doing this and who is it for and why is it for that? Um, so I've become a lot more intentional with things that I do. And I ask those questions fairly often, especially when I'm kind of feeling like, oh, I don't know about this. So what did anything physically change in your body after you started to download the, like how you wanted to structure your life? Yeah. So, I mean, when I, like when I left or now, or like when I started kind of figuring it out, when you started figuring it out, Oh, it took a minute. Um, yeah, I mean, (laughs) you know, I mean, again, like I, have started to find success professionally, um, which helped a lot of me being able to identify my strengths, but then it also allowed me to take a step back and reflect personally and like what I wanted in relationships and what I valued and like what, what my day, what I value in my day. Right. I mean, I had big goals for the future, but it starts with each day and how I show up each day and what that looks like. Um, so when I started kind of figuring it out, I started really thinking about, okay, who who is the future version of myself that I will truly admire when I get there? And then what do I need to do today to be that person? And forgiving myself for past mistakes and, you know, but in the same time, really investing as much as I can into the right energy with the people around me, um, but also into the time and knowledge that I can also expand myself. Oh, yeah. Because I think of sometimes we're stuck. We know we're stuck. We are so fearful of getting out of 
jail, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a book called The Patriarchy Stress Disorder that was written by Dr. Valerie Rain. And she talks about how women, especially, um, are stuck in like a jail because this is what ex is expected of us. Mm -hmm. Get married, have kids, maybe yep. have a job outside of the house. Who knows? And it's almost like we perpetuate this pattern mm -hmm. it, because we, some of us don't know any different or we're too afraid to make changes. But think about when you, outside of your jail cell, there are guards that keep you in the jail. Mm -hmm. So she talks about how when you actually make this conscious decision like you have, instead of the metaphor of being in the box, it's being in the jail. She teaches you how to structure these guards to turn into bodyguards. So instead of it being like to keep you in the jail, how can they protect you when you're out? Yeah, I love but that. You can only do that if you make that decision and then True. take action on the decision, which is what you did, which took a while. Mm -hmm. Right. How long was oh, yeah. this like journey? I mean, so I was with my ex for eight years total and we were married. I mean, I got married young. I got married when I was 22 and then divorced by or separated by 25. Um, so it took me. I mean, I knew on my wedding day I shouldn't have got married. It was one of those oh. like it was one of those gut instincts. Right. And there were there were things, of course, that happened leading up to it that pretty much validated that feeling and probably amplified it. But at the same time, you know, it, it does. Like for me, it's like even the second chapter of my book is called ne um, Never Quit on Yourself. And what I realized is I quit on myself long before I quit on, quit on the relationship. But I was I was scared to quit on the time and commitment the five years prior that we had already put in together. Right. And but those five years, I learned a lot. I gained a lot of experience. I had a wonderful time for the most part, you <laughs> kind of, you know, but, but at the same time, it's just it's one of those things where a lot of people are at dead ends relationships or careers or things that they worked so hard for, but they're like, great, if I just make a move now, then I've wasted all those years rather than taking the counterintuitive perspective and really the right approach. I would say more of the positive approach. And it's, you're not, you're not giving up, you've gained. And that knowledge and experience is the reason you're having this moment of like growth and transferring it to move forward, you know? Yeah. Oh, and the lessons and the inspiration to think what people you're motivating and inspiring by being the example of doing the thing that you did too. Yeah. Did, did anybody it, surface with like the, oh my gosh, Kayla, you helped me through this or thank you for sharing that or thank you for doing this. Well, now that I've started, I really didn't start sharing too much of my journey. I was really private about it um, until I started writing this book. And it's interesting how many people have uh, like outreached and said, this is amazing, have asked for... I mean, I, I get tons of people being like, hey, can we talk about this? Can we do this? And it's wonderful. Like, I love to to help. Um, and I think and I I think that's also when I remember when I told you, I was like, I just wanted to write this book to share my story because I knew it could be helpful and inspiring for others that are like, I just know how I felt. And I know from multiple conversations I have that that feeling that I had that I've been able to overcome and continue to build on with other challenges that arise in my life are still where people are like, scared to make that jump and the only difference oh, yeah. between me and them is i decided to take that one step forward and it was a big one i mean it was a huge leap but at the same time i i wouldn't be sitting here at all talking to you if i didn't make that one step forward you know and i think yeah. that's where yeah. we have to just get get comfortable being uncomfortable that's constantly said right but you turn you know self-doubt into self-belief and you know you take fear and turn it into faith and Finding that positive approach and just about anything, even when it's uncertain and finding certainty and uncertainty. Um, it's so scary. It is. It's like very I've scary. done career shifts. A lot of this too is wrapped up in identity. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of work that I'm doing around that too, not for myself, but also for myself, but also trying to really understand why we allow ourselves to stay stuck when we know something needs to change. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we think it has to be a massive change, but other times it doesn't. Yeah. And so when writing this book, so are you still working with that land developer? I am. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and what's, what's come of this book too? With like speaking gigs? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting how much is, has transitioned. So when I first started writing this book, like I said, 
it was just to write the book. And then mm-hmm. as through the journey, and then I've, yeah, I've done speaking engagements and building out workshops. I'm working on doing like other coaching opportunities. Um, so there's a lot evolving and a lot being put into place. And with that, there is things that are growing apart from, you know, the real estate. I mean, I think it's one of those things, again, identity is attached to it. I'm great at it. I've had a lot of success at it. I've been able to identify my strengths with it. I've formed incredible relationships with it. But you know what's right and when it's right. And it's interesting. We're always... The change that I made with my ex-husband was one example. But I've had those feelings, again, of kind of that clarity, like, you need to make this jump in other situations. And it's kind of what you're saying, though. You've just got to recognize it and actually take that first step. So what is... We'll use an example from me. (laughs) Um, I love CrossFit. I know that... When I am in the gym and I come home from a CrossFit workout, I am, regardless of how strenuous it was, it was that, it's like the happiest part of my day. My family knows when I went to CrossFit. Yeah. Um, We moved out here maybe three years ago, three and a bit years ago, and my CrossFit gym back on the East Coast was just like the best gym we've ever worked out in. And we've worked out in so many boxes across like the world. Mm -hmm. A different community here. Not to say that it's any better or worse. It's just different. I recognize the pattern in allowing myself to be too busy with work to even go and do the thing that makes me the happiest. Yeah. That is crazy. How do you speak to people through those moments, those thoughts of like being stuck, which is stupid. The solution really is, Renee, just I'm already up at five. So go to the six o'clock CrossFit class. Yeah. Why don't I do it? Yeah. And I mean, I think it's so interesting. I think everyone kind of operates differently. I think it's like procrastination, definitely. And it's tough sometimes, like when procrastination sinks in. But to talk through, I mean, gosh, it's interesting. I have to sometimes self-talk myself too. It's just taking the thoughts and then putting it into action. It is like, just go do it. But it's kind of like ripping off the Band-Aid. I started doing cold plunges recently Uh, and every morning, like it's one of the first things I do. And no matter what, I think it really is just that first step. Even with starting to write the book, I'm like, why am I not just writing it? Why am I not just doing it? And the first little bit of it is always going to be uncomfortable, but it's like, it's just showing up consistently, right? Discipline, discipline is always going to win over hard work because when you're disciplined and you're consistently like going to do it, no matter what, like you show up when it's hard, you show up when you don't want to, but you just freaking do it. And so the schedule on the East Coast was what primed me for success because yeah. I would bring my boys to the bus stop. They got picked up at 7.30 in the morning and it was pretty much like to the minute. And then my first, the first CrossFit workout for me that I could go to was at 7.45 and the place was four minutes up the road. Yeah. So as soon as the bus picked them up, I was already geared up, ready to go, go do CrossFit, come home, shower and start the day. And I would go to CrossFit five or six times a week. Right. It was like that much dedication because of the schedule. So the pattern worked that way. Mm-hmm. Here it doesn't. I, 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 I have to like come and go from the house two times just to bring them to school, come back. And so I'm just trying to figure out like the solution for me with like the schedules just lined up so perfectly. I couldn't not do it. And I mean, I will speak before even on the scheduling side from like the community it said you said that like the last one that you went to the community was amazing like it was the best box you ever went to and from doing crossfit i know that like i started in high school my dad was in afghanistan and he was working out over there and he got me into crossfit because he was working out on the bases and i was like oh my gosh like i need to try this he comes back with warrior abs I'm like what the heck is he doing you know <laughs> he went over there kind of overweight and came back literally looking like a freaking warrior and um but that gym they've been like second family to me and i've never found one better just haven't so that's and the community makes you show up so that i think aside like that's what i besides the work on crossfit the community is amazing so i un, i completely empathize with what you're feeling in terms of that and so maybe that's like there's there's a way of looking at it then because mm-hmm. now I'm throwing every excuse at the wall being like, ah, it's <laughs> not me. It's everything else in my life. It's me. Yeah. And the schedule thing, I mean, this gym is only 10 minutes away. If I can say that it is community because I go there, I always have a blast. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's really about reframing it. That's yeah. it. It's, it's always reframing, reframing it. Yeah. 
It's the reframe. It is. And I mean, the thing though, too, is, I mean, for me, there are days and I love working out. I always work out. It's a priority of mine. I'm a much better person. I'm like, you, I have to work out or I'm, I don't feel myself. I'm not, I'm not great. I'm really not. Um, so that's kind of a reminder too. I'm like, if I'm not showing up for myself first thing in the morning and doing the things that I need to do for myself, I'm not going to show up for the other people that need to be around me. And that's mm-hmm. a disservice, not only to myself, but everyone else that needs to be around me. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the part of discipline though, because even when we wake up and we don't want to show up, you do. And those that's the difference between hard work and people that are disciplined and consistently just keep doing it. Like Atomic Habits, right? Of course, it's one of the most well-known books, but it's yeah. the little things that you continue to do over and over and over again. And then it's like, boom, right? I know. So it's... Yeah, it's I'm probably married to the most disciplined person I know. And I'm like, wow, must be nice. Yeah. Like, well, how? It's inspiring. Honestly. It's so inspiring. It's really inspiring. My boyfriend's very much the same way. The dude has Maybe more discipline than I've ever like. And it, it definitely like <laughs> I got to have to give myself like some credit because I'm I've gotten so much better just using him even. And I'm a very yeah, disciplined yeah. person, but he is like to a T. And I'm like, how do you do this? You know, so I get I know. it. Well, he started this fitness program in December. He wanted to do with his media team a challenge called Project Visible Abs. So he read a study that there are, it's only like 10, what, what, it's such a small percent, like 1% of the American population actually has six pack abs or something like that, whatever it was. And like hardly any CEOs have any abs. Like they just don't work out because they're working all the time. Right. So he's like, I want to just prove them all that this is possible because he runs, he's a CEO at the time of two businesses. So he did it, but he was kind of not on target to reach the goal by the end of February. So this was only a couple months ago. So he hired, he was in this gym and he met this guy named Alan who looks like a massive bodybuilder. Turns out he's like Mr. Olympia type bodybuilder. Oh my God. And he's like, where do you work out? (laughs) Like, what do you do? Turns out he's a personal trainer. Long story short, within... Less than 90 days, because it was January, February, March, he got six-pack abs. He stuck to the routine, the meal plan, first, like, 14-day, had to do, like, this whatever detox, strict meal plan, strict exercise. He did everything that was prescribed by Alan, and he had the most magical outcome. And so people thought, oh, well, you must be doing, like, steroids or something. Nope. It was all natural. Yeah. And all I did, all I did was the two week kind of ish um, meal plan. Mm-hmm. And I didn't change how I worked out. So we went to Cabo a family vacation. And part of the, the goal of being there was so that he, my husband could do a photo shoot to kind of That's show awesome. the before and after of this 90 day transformation. And he's like, I want you to jump in on some photos. And I was like, not thinking I was physically prepared for this, like in a bikini. But let me tell you, And this was only 14 days. You would think that I could do crunchies for a million years. My abs were popping. Nothing was Photoshopped. I did not realize that I looked like that. Total Instagram. So I saw that picture. I was like, geez. Oh, they definitely (laughs) were. (laughs) You're kidding me. You you are are not lying. I was like, this this is a beautiful couple. (laughs) So here's the the point of the story is that all of this exists underneath us physically, Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Also, it exists underneath us um, emotionally, mentally. We know to the core what we need to do. Mm -hmm. We tell ourselves we're indecisive. We're not. We just don't make the decision. No. And it's, I mean, even like, I mean, your husband, he reframed, you know, saying like the statistic is most CEOs don't. He's he's a CEO of two companies and he's like, well, I'm going to prove them wrong. And I think that, you know, that kind of grit too is really important. Um, you have to tap into that. You have to tap into that kind of like inner psycho and embrace it and find what that trigger is. And I think one word that has really stuck with me is resistance. And you realize when you're resisting things and when you aren't, you know, that deep underlying feeling, you just keep talking it away, right? You're resisting it rather than just doing it. But finding the power of, it it was interesting. I actually had a lady, it was, she could, she could have been, I think it was one of those signs. It was one of those days where I needed kind of the reminder. And I swear she could have like completed my sentences, but she said resistance. And it was one of the first times anybody said the word resistance to me and the way she said it, it's like almost was my mind. I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. 
This is That's a time. good word. Just do it. Resistance. Yeah. It's, it was, it's, I think for me, one of the most powerful things because I realized for how long I resisted it. And even kind of going back to the being in the jail and like being stuck in the box, like I constantly resisted the idea that my life could look different than I expected it to. It didn't need to be checking the boxes of, you know, as we as women get married, have kids and follow this status quo life. Like, I didn't want any of that. I realized I was like, I mean, I, I want a partner. I, I didn't know when I wanted to be married. You know, I didn't know if I wanted kids. I still don't, you know, and quite, quite frankly, I, we don't have to know these things. We have to understand who we are and what we want to do and why we don't, we don't need whatever anybody says and judges and validates. It's interesting when you're so confident in what you know, like who you are and you, you show up as that, as you, your authentic version of yourself society and what they think you don't care like you don't you know like you you show up for you and the best version of yourself and like i said then you show up to the best for others because you're the best version of you um yeah so no so most people don't care so my story because it's still fresh not even a month ago i got rhinoplasty and i was terrified of sharing this because it's been 30 years in my mind five years in the making most people don't talk about doing things to their body unless it's like extremely noticeable, like getting huge tummy tuck or boob job. And I have no shame on people that want to do whatever they want for their body. Right. But I resisted even inquiring about what a process looks like because the thought of me even doing it meant that I was inauthentic because I wasn't telling people I was considering this. And right. so finally, my husband was on board. He took some convincing because he's like, you're beautiful the way you are. I'm like, yeah, but there's this thing on my face that I really don't like. Yeah. Finally got through the resistance. The reason why I never did it had nothing to do with the recovery or the surgery or the money that would need it to be invested in having this procedure. It was literally what I thought other people were going to say. Yeah. So immediately I put the power into everybody else's hands. Mm -hmm. And like no one in my not too many people in my adult life ever mentioned my nose. It was the bullying that happened in grade seven and eight that stuck with me for my lifetime and finally did it. And guess what happened? Nothing that I expected happened. Everybody was supportive. All of the messages of people saying, I got this done, I got that done, all of these like secret yeah. procedures that people got done. But thank you for being the brave person right. that actually shared the story for doing the thing that people are already doing or want to do Mm -hmm. Yesterday, I got a message from a friend's friend who said, thank you for suggesting this doctor. I actually booked a consultation with him. And I was yeah. like, this is cool. Giving people permission to face the resistance. For sure. So when you were going through your radical reinvention, what was the thing that worried you the most? I mean, yeah. I mean, I was absolutely scared of what people would think. And at that point, I wasn't confident in myself. You know, I, I just was confident that that wasn't the route that my life was going to be taking. But, you know, I was scared of, I mean, a failed marriage. I was scared of a failed just starting over. I was scared of what people would say about, you know, being divorced at such a young age. I was scared of losing friends and family and like their respect for me. Um, so yeah, it was definitely scary. But what was Did any very of that happen though? No. And that's right. the thing is, it's kind of exactly what happened, right? So what the more I've done like personal development work and reading and kind of like picking up on my own self, it's the one reminder because no matter what, I think, even though, like I said, I, I truly am so confident and like if I'm doing something, like if somebody has something to say about it or they don't believe it, more power to them. We all have our right to our own opinions and stuff. But if I'm confident enough in something, I'm going to do it. Like I just got a boob job and I love them, you know? So, I mean, I, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I completely, I mean, everyone's like, you didn't need it. I'm like, that's fine. I liked them. I want them, you know, I, whatever you say. That's exactly it. But, but and, and here's the thing is, Guess what? Most people don't even notice. <laughs> no, absolutely not. It's for yourself. Like you do yeah, these things exactly. for yourself and it's totally not. For yeah, it's a hundred percent for yourself. But I think when you stay for me, it's like fear is anxiety of the future. That's literally what it is. So when I start kind of getting in my head about what if I did this or that, like I'm creating these situations in my mind, like I'm creating these things that aren't real in my mind that usually don't happen. And What's the worst case scenario if it does happen, right? Yeah. Quite frankly, it ends up just showing one true colors of other people or true colors of situation or, oh, 
that wasn't the right decision. How do I fix it? You know, so when I can continue to keep things framed that way, it's always helped me. And I, I, you can definitely find confidence in that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So many things. One thing that actually just came to mind in all this too, is how I've always tried to uphold the fact that I'm a nice person Mm -hmm. because I like, I think I'm a nice person, but I also have boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I think what I'm seeing in our culture too, is like nice people just let people walk all over them. Mm -hmm. And that actually doesn't do anybody service. So you can be nice and have boundaries. You can be nice and say no. You can be nice and also not want to be with your partner. For sure. You can be nice and not love the job that you want and quit. You could be nice and fire your trainer because you don't like working with that trainer. You can still be a nice person. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I actually literally, I used to not have boundaries. Like I practically didn't even know what those even meant. And I write an entire chapter about how, how weak my boundaries were and not only like, you know, personal relationships, but also like it started to get to intimate, really other intimate relationships, how I lost control there, which also led led to me losing respect for myself and how I built that back and like understood how important boundaries are in everything. And you don't like identifying as a nice person shouldn't hold you back from that. You know, it's, yeah, it's, trust me, I get it. I'm the same way. I mean, it's redefining things. Like what does uh nice mean? Right. And I don't, and that's what I'm saying. We can't identify as just nice. That's no. such a, that's so simple, and it's not that it's like mm-hmm. simple's bad. I'm just that's literally a word for a certain situation. It's not to identify who you are. Um, All right, being that's just an adjective. Like I am nice, but I'm also a lot of other things. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I also sometimes I'm not nice because I need to not be nice in order to yeah. set the right boundaries or hold myself to the standard or you know not do a disservice to others. And I think that's the one thing I I do also say, and this is where I kind of even like being nice or like a yes woman where I used to go wrong is I would always serve others or think of others or think that this is how I need to do it before myself. And on a very counter and intuitive perspective, I actually posted a video about this and got a lot of praise and also a lot of backlash, which it's controversial essentially, because I do believe you need to be selfish before you can be selfless. And I don't mean like be selfish and like at the compromise of hurting others, but be selfish in the sense that you're taking care of yourself enough into your best ability to be able to show up as the best version of yourself mm-hmm. for others and be able to help others in an impactful way. Because I can tell you right now, until I did that for myself, I, I wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation with you. I wouldn't have written a book. I wouldn't have done anything. I wouldn't have started a nonprofit that I've started. Like, So I'm way more selfless now in a purposeful, intentional way than I used to be. And so that's when I say, like, be selfish before selfless. And I think that's so important. And I just think it's the easiest way to put it and redefine. Like, why can't we redefine what selfish really means, right? It's yeah. not at the compromise of others. It's at the actual, like, benefit of others. Yeah, I always say being selfish is the most selfless thing you can do. Because so a lot true. of people just don't take themselves into consideration. And also, I want to talk to you about this this thought process though feeling guilty about doing things as a mother Mm -hmm. um there's so much pressure to like spend more quality time with your kids do all these activities like right now both my kids have these entrepreneurial uh, affairs that they have to create stuff for to sell so i'm teaching them like the cost of goods sold and and they're like 10 and 11 years old they kind of get it all they know is they have to pay me back and that's that's fine it's a good start (laughs) but there's like even this afternoon The guilt, so the freedom I have to be able to do what I want when I want is why I became an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. However, there's also that guilt that boils up if I'm not working on client work all day. Right. The outcome still ends up happening. I don't have to work eight hours a day. Yeah. The guilt also boils up if I'm like, I have the option to be with my kids today from like three till five, because I don't have to work. There's no meetings. There's space in my calendar, although I do have work tasks that I have to do, or I could go get my nails done, or I could go shopping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the pattern that I see my thought process is do the thing that's going to make you feel less guilty, not the thing that's necessarily right for me. Yeah. I like you that a lot, I mean? actually. And I think, I mean, I, I don't have kids, but I do have like a lot right now I'm balancing with 
you know, even with real estate, I mean, it's 24 seven, you're working with clients and then also with the nonprofit and then with this book launch and building everything else. So I know I need to simplify. Trust me. I I fully understand (laughs) there's some simplifying that needs to happen, but I'm the same way. I'm like, okay, so with all these things, like you kind of just like you're treading water until you're like, okay, I want to like take off and full swim. What do I need to do in order to do that? And for me, I just get overwhelmed. And when I have too many things that I feel too guilty about that, I'm like, I'm just going to do nothing. <laughs> you know? That's it. And then you're just, just shut down and like all the guilt. Yeah. And then you're just like, okay, I'm just going to procrastinate this guilt until tomorrow. And it's like, I, and I don't, I trust me, I don't do this. I clearly don't do this all the time, but there are days where I'm just like, Oh God, what do I do? You know? And it's, yeah. it is tough, but I like the way you frame that. It's literally like, what is going to, you know, be less guilty. And my dad, actually, we would do some mentoring sessions and he's like, when I do to-do lists, I always put, you know, my top priorities in terms of the stuff that I don't want to do first. Yeah. I just knock them out, get them done. And I, I started doing that and it actually is very rewarding. It's the stuff you're like, oh, what they, gosh, yeah, I it's do like it. the, um, the Mark Twain quote eat the frog in the morning you know those the quote yeah I if it's your know. job to eat a frog better do it first thing in the morning and if it's your job to eat two frogs it's best to eat the largest one first yeah and that's it's so true it's interesting yeah. how like when you just get the largest feet or the most one like even sometimes they're like stupid like it shouldn't be so stressful and they are and I'm just like oh really don't want to do this but then you do it and like it creates the momentum for the rest of the day and but I do also believe and I used to not be this way I would just constantly go 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 and I realized it was also making me counterproductive I wasn't sleeping enough like I was pulling back in different areas that I really prioritized, but I was prioritizing too heavily in other areas where I was devaluing areas that I valued more. And now like I do believe in unproductivity for productivity. So I really do like, yeah, there day- there's days where I'm like, I'm not doing yeah. anything. Keep yep. my phone away. Like I'm like, there is not an emergency that needs me today. <laughs> <laughs> the weekend's good for that too, which got me thinking too. Cause like, I like the word resistance, but then there could be, also a word connected to that, which is avoidance. Mm-hmm. Yes. They're absolutely. different, but they're the same. So what would you say, like in the context of what we are talking about too, what would be the difference between avoidance and resistance? So resistance, I would say is like when you, again, you know, that like deep underlying feeling, you know what it is and you're just, you're, you're just not doing it. Like you're just staying stuck. And like you're resisting what's meant for you. Whereas I think avoidance is you literally, you know, it's there, but you're just, you're just doing other things. Yeah. So resistance is like, you know, the thing you need to do, but you're not doing it. Avoidance could be like, maybe you're unsure if that's what I really have to do, but you're also not doing the work to figure out what it is you have to do that. Yeah. It's like, it's a different kind of way of like procrastination, but I like avoidance better because like, I feel like procrastination, I'm trying gosh, I heard this on an audio book the other day. It was, it was an amazing way to put procrastination. When you procrastinate things that they're, it's not meant for you. Procrastination really is actually a good thing for entrepreneurs because you realize like if you're procrastinating something, I mean, if you took the step to be an entrepreneur, like you have the work ethic, you have the mindset, you, you're there, like you're jumping in, you're ready to go. Like you're, you operate a little bit differently, but when you procrastinate things like that's just not kind of in our realm it's usually not for you like you're pushing off or that that now yeah that it's also a trauma response it is it is yeah but i like that it is probably not for you i think that's the easiest way for me to understand it no for sure (laughs) it's just like not so simple i'm like just tell me and i'm like oh my gosh and it was weird i was procrastinating these things when they said that i was like it was like that again clarity i was like it's so right. I'm not supposed to be doing this. Job. Right? And it wasn't like validating that. It's just, I already knew that. And maybe that is avoidance. It's like you already know it's not for you or it's not for you now. And you're just yeah. pushing it off. Whereas resistance is like you're doing the wrong things when yeah. you should be doing the other things that you know, is you there. know what the other thing is. Yeah, you you're doing do. the, you're doing the other stuff. That's hard. It's almost harder, right? When you resist things, things become harder for you. It's not easy. It's not flowing. Like I always say, I'm like, if things feel like hard and wrong and you're forcing it, it's wrong for you. Like if you're yeah. forcing things, it is so wrong for you and you can feel it. And I, I like, I know when I'm doing things, I'm like, I'm putting my yeah. energy and effort into something I shouldn't be right now. Like, right. It, it, it gets heavy. And you can yeah. feel it and it sucks. And it's one of those things that I'm very aware of it now because like I've 
like obviously like I just from experience, but we all have those feelings. Cause again, reflecting like from kind of the beginning of this, when I was saying, I thinking back now, there were so many moments I knew I was resisting. I didn't know that's what it was then, but you just, when it feels heavy, when it feels wrong, you're resisting, you know what to do. You're just not doing it. You're not taking that first step. You're not making that leap. My body physically reacts. Like mm-hmm. I will get digestion. Yeah. I won't get my period. I'll get hot flashes. Like all these things leading up to getting my procedure done. We also did a crazy like travel season for a month and a half. We were like home and gone, home and gone from like Mexico to LA to the other side of Canada to Tokyo to home to Nashville, which is on the other side of the continent from where we are. Right. Right. And then it just came home, was home for 24 hours and then went to Vancouver to get my surgery and then came home to recover. So my body was like, what is going on? Mm-hmm. Yeah. My mind and out externally looked really tough. Like I'm doing this. People are like, how do you do this? And I'm like, inside I'm dying. But I got to project the idea that I can handle this. Mm-hmm. A lot of the times, most of the, actually most of the times, my body will uh, delay the stress. Mm -hmm. So like, I'll be okay while I'm in it. But then when I finally have a moment to sit down and be like, ah, that's when my body's like, okay, now's the time to like go crazy. Oh, for sure. But when I made that decision to actually share with the world that I was getting a nose job done, oh my God, it's like my period came back, night sweats went away, anxiety vanished literally overnight. I was like, wow. Yeah. I was resisting sharing the story that meant so much to me and clearly for other people too. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's so interesting. And like, but the thing is about the no job, no job, like you wanted that, right? So like authentically, that's what you wanted. That's the reason you decided to, you didn't do it for anybody else, but yourself. And the highest emotional frequency is authenticity. It's yeah. not love. It like, it's 40 times greater than love. And I mean, I'm sure there's way more deeper researches, but it, it makes so much sense. Like people that like have that attraction, that light, like they're just living life the way they want to. It's just, yeah. it's different. And I think like even like through my book, like the stories, they're, they're again, they're very raw. They're very relatable. And I think that's the another very underlying message. It's again, designing your own destiny. It's showing up as the real authentic version of yourself for you. And if, if you want to go get a no job, you want to go get a boob job, you want to go to Mexico, you want to go to and save the sea turtle, whatever you want to do. If that's what you truly want, you're going to be successful at it because it's what you want to do. You don't have to do all these things. Um, and it's interesting how it, but it does attract different opportunities. It attracts the right people to help you get there when you are living in that, like I would say, like vibrational totally frequency right. of like what you're supposed to be doing. We all have a purpose here and it's not up to us to like figure it out. Like we know it, like we deep it's down know it. it. We've just got to be willing to pull it out and stay true to it. And it makes the tough times easier when you're actually living in alignment with your values, the life you want to live, mm-hmm. surrounded by the people you want to be surrounded by. It's so true. So even after, like before, the moments between sharing it with my circle and getting the procedure done was like it already energetically could feel the difference. Yeah. But I'll tell you, the moment I woke up in the recovery room and I was still like a little out of it and the nurse is like, do you want a popsicle? I'm like, yes, I want a popsicle. I just knew I could sense it spiritually, emotionally, physically, that I was already happier yeah. and lighter person because I'd finally made that decision. And it's like blood coming out of everywhere. And I was like, yes, I did it. <laughs> and I actually right now do not care what anybody thinks. Yeah. Because when you take that leap and it's almost always better on the other side, just don't resist it anymore. Just go do it. <laughs> it's so true. It literally is. And like, it's it's interesting even like i mean it's funny we're not talking about plastic surgery but like when i got my boob job it was not good timing <laughs> like i mean i have a book launch coming up i had a big event for work i was moving like it was a t- terrible time but kind of a good time because of like going into summer you know parties and like oh, so this uh, is new for you oh yeah i just recently like wow three, yeah like four weeks ago and okay yeah we got this at the same time what yeah that's crazy that Super god would weird. be like we're gonna put these ladies yeah. together they're gonna talk about their <laughs> plastic surgeries yeah and it's, i mean it's the only one i've ever done but like i've always wanted to do it like i really have and it's yeah. my 30th birthday this year and i was like i went to a doctor and like 
highly recommended. And he was amazing, had an awesome consultation. And like, I'm somebody like if I'm going to like to a doctor's appointment to do something like this, or if I'm going to look at a car, like I'm coming to make an appointment, I'm buying, right? I'm ready to go. Like, let's, let's, let's do it. And so he had a last minute cancellation literally two weeks after my consultation. And I was like, all right, cut me open. Wow. So that's what ended up how, and it was kind of the one Monday that would have worked. If it was a week before it wouldn't have worked, if it was a week after it wouldn't have worked. And I was like, you know what? Screw it. But like, yeah. I was even talking to my mom. I was like, there's no good time. There's never, never a good time. If we keep waiting for the best time, that's a whole moral of me going back to this. But like, if we keep waiting for the best time, it's never going to present itself. Like you create the time, right? The time is now. If you're thinking about it, just, just do it. Right. Yeah. I mean, of, of or course. make the time literally clear your calendar is uh, which what I is what we did is so every year um, we'll, we'll wrap things up quickly. But every year in December, my husband and I, we go away for a couple's retreat and we look at the whole year ahead. Yeah. And we put in like the big rock stuff, little rock stuff. And there was this gap in April. And I was like, OK, well, I think this is the time. I don't know what recovery was going to be like, but I'll just gauge three weeks. We'll just say worst case stereo. Really, the next day it was like fine, but it worked out. And that was a good time for me. But of course, there could have been other reasons why it wasn't the right time. Right. But we, it was a priority. We made it mm-hmm. like work for us. Yeah. <laughs> it was going to work for us because I wanted it done. <laughs> right. Well, and like you said, the word priority covers it, right? If it's a priority, like, again, it, there's time. You can, again, create the time. So it's there. Yeah. It always, 100%. 100%. Okay. Uh, we could chat forever. I love how I, this conversation went. I, I do have one <laughs> last question for you. Yeah. <laughs> when I ask you what it means to be a wild woman, what is that to you? Ooh. I mean, honestly, I think it kind of ties into all the conversations we just had being but authentic and real. Um, because that's that's hard nowadays. It's mm-hmm. hard to feel like you can show up and be who you are without feeling that judgment. I mean, and be confident enough to not carry that weight of that getting to the point where you know who you are enough, even in the challenges, it's not easy. Like, it's not just like, yeah, I'm amazing. Here I am. Right. Like you show up, but you, you do it in a way that, you know, you're making an impact, but it's also purposeful for yourself. And Mm -hmm. it's, it's wild to, to make and take big risk and take those jumps and do that. But at the same time, I mean, it's important and you, you'll live a much happier, more fulfilling life when you can just be true and real to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Kayla, people want to go online to find you and follow you. Where can they go? So my website literally has everything. It's Kayla Logue, L-O-G-U-E dot com. Um, so my Instagram is Kayla Logue underscore. But all my social handles, literally anything, blogs, book, all my stuff is on my website. Um, okay. So Kayla dot com is the place to go. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me.